Chapter 15, Flora. Excerpt from the Citizens' Assembly on the Raising of Taxes on the Gridlock. Report number 122. Testimony from Randomly Selected Citizen, Ms. Apple Burke. It's all pointless. We know that the Hope Runner Championship is a carrot that lures people into keeping the gridlock alive. More hope, more people booking their spot to leave, more market activity, more taxes. This whole commission or fact-finding session or whatever the heck this is, is a joke. For Flora, the championship was about finding answers. But for the city, it was about hope. Merchandise was scattered throughout stores, and in many homes across the city, the kids would play, running and jumping from couch to couch or pavement to pavement. The championship runners did not need to be present to receive information about the trial. But it was for the city to ignite the combustion of hope with a cheerful face and dance. It was an acceptable trade-off for Flora to get closer to her competitors. The last time she stood in front of the Hope Runner's office, her phone dove into a puddle. Now, she was a runner, surrounded by cheering fans. She made her way to the entrance, nodding to the crowd but not meeting their gazes. She complied to the fake formality until she heard a young girl shout her name. Flora! She stopped and turned towards a girl in the crowd wearing keys as earrings. Flora couldn't help but smile as the girl extended a photo of her. She took it, signed it, and saw the girl jump up and down before she was swallowed by the crowd, others clamoring for Flora's signature. It was suddenly overwhelming, and she excused herself from the responsibility. The city was relying on her to provide hope for them when she had never truly felt hopeful. Seeing the girl's face light up made Flora feel something she hadn't felt before. Was that hope? The roars died down as soon as she entered the Hope Runner's office. Inside, a cavernous atrium shielded a large, long-distance Hope Mech statue. In a circle surrounding it were the statues of Hope Runners of Champions Past. Flora's eyes followed them through the dust moats until she saw her father's statue, dapper with his metal arms at his side. She had only seen it once before when it was unveiled. It made her mother uneasy, and when Flora was older, seeing her father, but not really being able to interact with him, tortured her. Now she was standing in front of him, and despite her misgivings, she breathed a sigh of relief. It was as if he told her that she was on the right path. Flora felt inside her pocket for her bracelet and held it tighter. He was with her. It wasn't long until the assistants called them towards the briefing room. On the way there, Photos of the previous championships adorned the walls. Cheering crowds, artful jumps, sun shimmering off the mechs, and champions waving back to the city. Inside the briefing room, a few chairs for the Hope Runners waited. There they were. Darius, Sonny, Argent, Buck, Satello, Cassidy, Omo, Richter, and Mickey. She pretended not to notice them. However, she could not help but steal a glance towards Sonny Augustus. The pull to understand who he was overpowered Flora's ability to remain inconspicuous. She sat down alongside them as a man in a corduroy suit walked up to the podium with a stack of papers. Seemed like someone that liked brown shag carpets, gold plastic cups, and smelled like mothballs. Welcome, he said smiling. This is so exciting, he slammed the podium. My name is Ace Marlowe, and I'm the director of the Hope Runners office. We are just really excited to get started. This is the most important Hope Runner championship in our history as a city. You all heard the people out there shouting, shouting. We've never had so much hope. Yep, Flora's suspicions were probably right. Mr. Marlowe shuffled through his papers. We've always had contingency plans for potentialities like this, and we are ready, ready, ready. Let me tell you, we are ready. As you all know, this championship is different from others, given the seriousness. We assume you know what you got yourselves into because, duh, you signed up for it. But we want to make sure it's all as clear as our hope. Today, we will brief you on the championship. Ready? He was desperately trying to share excitement with the Hope Runners and the media. Hopefully, he wouldn't start a slow clap or dance along, he continued. We will have only two trials. Only two. One, two. We will drop the long-distance run this year. Thus, 
we will have the desert run around the dome of the city, three laps, clockwise. After that, the top five championship runners will proceed to the next and final trial two weeks later. That one is the same as the usual final trial. Traverse your way through the city and the dome. The track will follow running on skyscrapers, bridges, up the dome, through the top hole, and back down to the final sprint across the final chasm. The last jump, pretty massive. Instead of only one winner, three of the final five will become hope runners, a first for our city. Are there questions? No one raised their hand. It was unlike her, but she wanted to fill the silence, so she asked a question she already knew. Fuel limits? What's the fuel limits per run? Ms. Kygo, great question. It's in the brochures, but for the fans watching on the television, we have lowered the limit. This is to ensure that true cunning and not just brute force running will decide the championships. Gotta be cunning. Gotta be smart. Also remember, no funny business. A real hero does not cheat. Your mechs will be certified by our wonderful Mech Institute. Are there any more questions? Media? Mr. Marlowe, Steve from GNN. Why was the long-distance mech trial canceled? Isn't that the most important one? Steve, great question. Having three Hope Runners run together will give them substantial longevity. We need to test their cunning. That's why it was dropped. Mr. Marlowe, Ika from Frontier News. The Hope Runners office has received lots of complaints from citizens over its blanket usage of city funds, including running this Hope Runner championship four years earlier than usual. Many citizens are not happy with the possible changes to tax policy in the public car markets. What do you say to that? Miss Ika, great question. There's no cost to providing hope with a capital H for this city. Many are not happy, but many more are happy. The Constitution allows us this fortuitous ability to run these championships. It was the mayor's choice, and we are happy to use the funds available. Whatever Parliament decides on tax policy, we will stand by them. A man raised his hand. Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Linger from the Alliance. If all long-distance Hope Runner mechs have cameras equipped, why were Armin's cameras destroyed? Mr. Marlowe took a sip of water. This matter is still under review by the Investigation Bureau, and we ask for sensitivity around the matter until it is completed. All I can say at this point is a report will be out before the championship itself. We are not recklessly running this championship. I can assure you that. For sure. This concludes the questioning. Shouts of Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! Still ran through the press corps as he hurriedly disappeared into the back. The Hope Runner candidates got up as the press called after them. Flora heard her name being called, but she tried to find Sunny through the sudden crowds. She was about to get up from her seat when Argent, with her line tattoo across her face and scruffy hair, came to sit down next to Flora. Argent's sudden appearance and formidable frame stunned her. Hi, Argent said, extending her hand. Flora was taken aback. She shook Argent's hand. I haven't seen you running or training in the city. Where have you been training? Arjun asked. Flora frowned, trying to understand Arjun's smile. Flora wanted to remain low profile. Simulators, mostly. That's amazing. I used to train in them a lot as a kid, still do today. Allows you to try all the crazy things you can't easily try outside. Armin also mostly trained in simulators. Flora's face lit up. She couldn't help herself from feeling excited to share the joy of the simulators. So true, I feel a lot freer in them, so much easier. You surely must train outside or in a proper mech, though, Arjun asked again. Her question suddenly felt they had a different intent. Argent, respectfully, I just met you, Flora replied, reeling her excitement back in. Oh, shit. Yes. So sorry. Totally. I wasn't trying to get anything out of you. Sorry. I saw your hand go up asking a question, and I thought I would just come say hi. Listen, I can help you if you need it. We're competitors, you and I, but at the end of the day, this is all about creating hope, you know? Armin taught me that, and I want to help where I can. As Argent got up, Flora spotted a locket on her neck. Flora's hand went into her jacket pocket, feeling her father's bracelet. Did she also keep her loss with her? Argent, thanks. I will. Flora replied. Argent nodded and smiled as she strutted towards the press corps. From behind Flora came a man's voice. 
She is the one to watch. Holy shit, she's got fire in her for sure. Startled, Flora turned around to Satello. She retreated on the chairs. Dude, um, hi to you too? <laughs> Sorry, hey, listen, I know Palma is helping you, but not anymore. You clearly don't know what you're doing. But it's okay, I can help you. We must work together against people like Argent. Flora had only really been engaged with Rulo and not the others, and he mentioned nothing about Palma. What do you mean Palma is not helping anymore? Wait, you don't know? Of course, his phone got confiscated right after. He is grounded like a little bitch. He got caught snooping on his parents' emails. Such a dumbass. So yeah, he can't do shit anymore. But yeah, not like it would have mattered anyway. I'll still win. Flora's head was swimming. She looked up at Satello, more well-built than Palma, that's for sure. Satello, I appreciate your help. I'll let you know. Flora said as politely as possible, trying to get him to leave. She got up, grabbed her brochures, and rushed to the bathroom. In a stall, she shuddered and took a deep breath. Palma was gone, indefinitely, and Rulo wasn't going to teach her anything. She pressed against the walls of the bathroom stall, stealing herself from feeling dizzy, truly alone. She didn't want help, but now she realized that with Palma gone, it wouldn't be available at all. Outside, the press corps buzzed, Reversing her posture, she took another deep breath, stood up strong, and strutted back out. Miss Kygo! Came a reporter's voice as she entered. Miss Kygo, what message do you have for your fans, for the citizens of Gridlock? In her head, she wanted to shout out, Hope is a toilet! She forced a smile instead and replied with Argent's earlier advice. We're all competitors here. All the Hope Runner candidates, but we're ultimately here to provide hope. If you look at me or any of us and you feel that fire burning inside you, then I'm happy to keep providing that. Personally, I'm excited to run. Just as she had finished those words, it felt like she forgot it. It felt meaningless. Platitudes. The reporter looked back at her notes and asked Flora another question. We haven't seen you practicing in the open out in the city. You haven't announced your mech team or your training partners. We are excited for the reveal. When will it be? Flora swallowed her anxiety. You will be surprised for sure. Been planning for that. Flora nodded thanks and left before she said something she regretted. As she turned around, Sunny Augustus strolled towards her with a smile. It sent a shock down her spine. It's the same smile she saw in the family photo that hung at the front of their bus. He looked like her father, or whatever memory she still had of him. Hey, Flora, right? I'm Sunny. Hi, yes. Flora's abrupt response briefly confused Sunny. Straight, I like that. I'll be honest with you, there's three people that will become Hope Runners this year. There's a reason to work together, not just for hope, but to ensure that the best three will win. You might not know me, but I know you. If you want to train together and create a strategy, let me know within the next day, he said, pulling out his phone. Flora fumbled into her pockets and also pulled out her phone. They tapped and shared contact details. As he walked off, Flora called to him. Wait. Yes? Who are you? Huh? I'm Sunny. Sunny Augustus. There's more to my story, but I only have time if you want to work together. Flora, frazzled, simply nodded. Now she only had more questions. It all became overwhelming, so she ducked through the cacophony of shouting and camera shutters back to the atrium. As the door closed the buzz turned off like a noisy amp being unplugged. The spacious atrium, bereft of press, not only allowed her footsteps to echo, but also her mind. When she walked closer to the center, it startled her to see Arjun in front of Armin's newly minted statue. Looking at her solid lover, Arjun smiled and released a trembling sigh. Even though it had been years for Flora, she knew what that sigh meant. Few understood. Flora strolled over. Argent, I know how hard it is to let go. Argent pushed back tears and nodded. She held on tightly to a locket close to her heart. Flora's hand was in her own jacket, holding on tightly to her father's bracelet. Argent let go of the locket and opened it up. It was a picture of Armin, Argent, and Argent's daughter, Piper. This way, he's always with me, Argent said. Only Flora's mother knew about her bracelet. 
Despite Flora's incessant search for answers, she kept this truth from everyone. In that little world in her pocket, her father was alive, and if others would see it, it felt like he might disappear. Flora nodded at the locket and shared a face of sympathy. She wanted to share her own bracelet with Argent, but wasn't sure if she could trust her yet. Argent closed the locket. If you don't need help with training, we can also just talk and share stories about them. Think about it. Flora nodded. It sounded nice. Argent disappeared back into the press room, leaving Flora alone with her father. She walked closer to his statue and admired it. No one else was around, so she leaned forward and hugged him. It was the closest she'd been since she confusedly had to say goodbye as a child. He felt closer than ever. She had to win, and her best bet was Sonny. He not only had a strategy, but she could get closer to understanding what he was hiding. He agreed to meet.